So glad to be here with you today. You know, we make a few decisions in life that change our lives forever and ever. And back in 1987, uh, I made the decision to attend a first service ever for me at Christian Worship Center in Providence, Kentucky, pastored by this young man, Gary and Rose Brothers. And that was one of the best decisions that I've ever made. And I know you share that decision because you're here today. And I'm so thankful for you. Thankful for Pastor Rose and Gary, for Pastor Chad and Monica. So great to be here with you this morning in this series, the second message called Creatures of Habit. You know, we form our habits and then our habits form us, don't they? Habits are those ingrained actions that we do over and over and over again until they become routine. It's, it's like they are, they're, they're like on a vinyl album. They are grooved into our lives and we just play them over and over again. Maybe you have a habit like that. Have you ever maybe moved from one house to a different house and on the way home from work, you went to the old house just out of habit? I've done that before. You know, even in the law, as Chad said, I'm an attorney, I practice law, primarily helping churches, but in the federal rules of evidence, there is habit evidence that can be introduced into court as evidence. Habit evidence is the evidence that a particular individual has repetitively responded to a certain set of circumstances with particularity and with consistency over a period of time. And you can introduce that as evidence. For example, if they said, well, where were you on Sunday morning? You would say, I'm at church because every Sunday morning I'm at church. I don't wake up and decide whether or not to go. It's Sunday, so I'm in church. I get in my car, I put on my seatbelt. I drive through Chick-fil-A, I get a diet Dr. Pepper. It's my habit. <laughs> and you can introduce that as evidence. Why? Because habits are powerful. Habits are powerful. Habits start off incrementally, but then they build explosively. They start off incrementally. Sometimes you start a new habit and about a month in you go, Pfft, this isn't getting me anywhere. You start a new habit, six weeks in, you're like, I, I don't feel any difference. But watch this, ready? What is one plus one? One plus one is two, right? Two plus two is four plus four is Eight plus eight is 16 and 16 is, man, we haven't gotten very far, have we? We've just gotten from one to 32, incremental. 32 and 32, 64 and 64. Okay, some of y'all, we're losing you here. 64 and 64 is what? 128, 128, 128 is what? 256, all right, 256 and 256, what is that? 512, 512 and 512, what is that? I don't know, I'm a lawyer, not a mathematician. I just need to know what a third is so I can collect my check from your contingency. I used to have to just know what a 10th was so I could know your tithe, but I've improved in the world, I'm up to a third. Did you see what happened though? Incremental and then explosive because of our good habits. Pastor Gary talked last week about there are two kinds of habits. Did you enjoy that message last Sunday? I think I've been listening, only one person in this room has been listening to this man preach longer than I have. And she's sitting right beside him. I calculate, I've been listening to him preach for 36 years. I think last Sunday's message was as fresh and anointed as any message has been. Aren't you thankful? After 36 years, he could be recycling, retreading, rebranding, bringing something out from the past. I know I've preached all of his sermons practically all over the country. <laughs> Just got to change the name from, from Rose to Amberly and all those stories. That's a... <laughs> See, some of y'all got it. It kind of trickled. Sometimes that's how the Lord works. It just starts over here. But what a powerful message. He said, that there are good habits and those good habits become, uh, they, they become spiritual disciplines, but he said there are bad habits and they become spiritual strongholds. They start off incremental and then they're explosive, but watch this, bad habits start off incrementally too. And then they become implosive and our life implodes under the weight of our bad habits. 
And so last Sunday, he talked about togetherness. And this Sunday, I want to talk about faithfulness. And I want to talk about faithfulness in the sense of being faithful to some spiritual disciplines, integrating spiritual disciplines into our lives. And particularly today, I want to talk about integrating God's word into our lives. How many of you have your Bible with you this morning? Let me see your hand. You may have it on the phone. You may have it in paper. You may have it some way. But I want to talk about the habit of faithfully integrating the power of God's word into your life. And we're going to take a look at Matthew, but I want us to start off this morning, if we could. We're going to, we're going to look at several different passages. But I want us to start off this morning in Matthew chapter 8, verse 23. Matthew chapter 8, verse 23. Here's what the Bible says. Then Jesus got into a boat, and the disciples followed him. Suddenly, um, wait, that's not the right verse. Let me, back, let, me, let me go over a little bit further. We're, Matthew 7, not 8, Matthew 7, the wise and foolish builders. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose up, And the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had as its foundation the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose up, the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell to the ground. How many remember singing this as a song in children's church? You know, the rains come down and the floods come up and the house that's built on the rock stands firm. The house that's built on the sand goes splat. What is the rock that it's built on? Let's go back. It's a habit. Look back at at verse number 24. Everyone who does what? Who hears these words of mine and does what? Puts them into practice. The Bible says, Jesus says, that there is power in the habit of being faithful to hearing the word of God and putting the word of God into practice in your life. This morning, I want to talk to you briefly about four benefits of faithfully integrating the word of God into your life. Because when we build our lives on God's word, our house will stand. But when we don't build our lives on God's word, our house will falter. The first benefit of putting our our trust in God's word, of following after God's word is this. When we build on God's word, our lives stand in the storm. When we build on God's word, our lives stand in the storm. In the storm. Here's the question. Pastor Gary talked about last Sunday that when we build good habits, those good habits push us toward God's purposes and God's plans for our lives. How many of you in this room who are believers in Jesus want God's purposes and plans to be fulfilled in your life? Raise your hand all over the room. Yes, that I don't care. That really doesn't matter. I'm going to quote somebody I don't really like, somebody I don't have a lot of respect for because he's from Indiana (laughs) and he coached the Hoosiers and I'm from Kentucky and we don't like Indiana. Have you ever heard of coach Bobby Knight? Yeah, yeah, not a fan, but here's what he said. He said, the will to prepare to win is much more important than the will to win. Let me say that again, Bobby Knight said this, the will to prepare to win is much more important than the will to win. We raised our hands all over the room and almost every person who's a believer in Jesus Christ all across this room said, guess what, Pastor Glenn? I want to win at life. I want to fulfill God's purposes. I want to fulfill God's plan in my life. But that's not really the question. The question is, are you willing to prepare to win? Are you willing to do the habits, to be faithful, to be humble, to pray, to fast, to get God's word into your heart? Are you willing to day after day do what God says to do so that you can prepare to fulfill his purposes and his plans for your life. How many are willing to do that this morning? Say amen. 
And so that's what we want to do. I want to just encourage you today that one of the foundational habits we have to have as a believer is that we have to understand that God's word is our authoritative guide for our lives. God's word gives us clarity in times of confusion. God's word gives us clarity in times of confusion. How many of you have ever been confused? Yeah. How many of you ever walked through your own house at night? I mean, this is your house, right? Not your neighbor's house. It's your house you live in every day. It's your house that you have arranged the furniture and put it right where your wife told you to put it <laughs> after she told you to put it somewhere else. This is your house. You're familiar with it, but when it's dark, you're in the middle of confusion, aren't you? And when you're confused, you walk tentatively. You walk slower. You're not sure where you're going. Your steps aren't as sound as they would have been. Here's what the word of God says in, in, in Psalm 119, verse 105. The word of God says this, that God's word is a what? Lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We live in a very dark and confused world, don't we? We live in a world that is confused about things that we never thought the world would be confused about. And in that darkness, we have to have something to guide us. And that guide is the word of God. Here's what I've found out, though. It's not just the world that's confused. It's the church. In the most recent, in the most recent study or poll by Legionnaire Ministries just in 2021, in that poll, here were the results. One out of three believers, one out of three evangelical believers, people who describe themselves as born again, one out of three said they didn't believe that Jesus Christ was the son of God. I'm not sure how you're born again if you say that. 46% believe that people are born inherently good. Now, now, we believe people have the image of God in them, but listen, we are born as sinners in need of a savior. That's what the Bible says. But nearly half of people who describe themselves as believers, a third say, not sure Jesus is the son of God. Half nearly say, hey, we're all born good. Well, if we're born good, why do we need a savior? Well, just to make us feel better, help us out till we die. I don't know. And watch this. One out of five said that changing your gender is a perfectly appropriate moral choice. This is not the culture. This is the church that is confused theologically. Here's what I want to call us back to. You're confused. Why? Because we're listening to all the wrong voices. We're listening to Fox News and Oprah and CNN and this voice and that voice. And what we have to listen to is what does the word of God say? It's the word of God that gives us clarity in times of confusion. When we build on God's word, we withstand the storm. We have clarity in times of confusion. The second thing I want you to notice the word of God can do for you today. And why am I sharing this with you? Because I want to get you into a habit of getting into God's word. Second thing God's word can do for you today is that God's word will deliver you in times of temptation. God's word will deliver you in times of temptation. We don't have time to go there, but if you turned and if you looked at the Bible in Hebrews chapter 4, 15, here's what the Bible says. The Bible says that we have a savior who has been tempted in every way that we have been tempted, yet is without sin. And if you go to Matthew chapter number four, you see Jesus who has been praying who has been led by the Holy Spirit, who has been fasting. He has the habit of prayer, the habit of fasting, the habit of being led by the Holy Spirit. And even in the midst of that, he is tempted by the enemy. Here's what I want you to know. He's tempted and yet he is what? Sinless. Let's say it again. He is tempted yet he is what? Sinless. Sinless. You say, well, I... He couldn't have been tempted like what I'm tempted. No, the Bible says in Hebrews 4, 15, he's tempted in every way. What is it that lures you away? What is it that entices your heart? What is it that induces you to do the things you don't wanna do? Whatever it is, the Bible says Jesus was, a was tempted exactly with those things and yet he was sinless. 
You say, well, Pastor Glenn, I can't be sinless. I agree because the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we say we have no sin, the truth isn't in us. But just because we can't be sinless doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to sin less. How many think that's a good idea? Let's try to sin less. So how did Jesus resist the temptation of the enemy? In Matthew chapter four, the enemy brought a temptation. And what did Jesus say? Three words. Do you remember over and over? He says, it is written. Well, how about this? Nope, it is written. Well, how about that? Nope, it is written. Jesus used the word of God to be delivered from temptation. Now, here's what I want you to know. It's not that he just spouted the word of God. Number one, he had to know it. He had to study it. He had to have, remember, we all want the, we all want to win, but do we all want to prepare to win? Jesus had to prepare to win because he didn't have his iPhone to look up the U version and get a word of God real quick there. He had to have had the will to prepare by studying, memorizing, and getting God's word in his heart. But here's what I want you to know. He just didn't spout the word at the enemy and say, here's the word, here's the word, here's the word. It's written, it's written, it's written. I want you to go back and read those things. Here's what the word of God did. The word of God exposed every lie within each one of those temptations. And see, this is how we fight temptation with the word of God. We know it enough in our heart to understand what is the lie that's embedded in that temptation. And the truth of the word exposes the lie in that temptation. And that's how we're able to deny that temptation. You can't just find a, you can't just get it on a plaque and yell it at the devil. You have to have it in your heart to understand. This is what the devil's saying, but this is what God's word says. Here's the lie in that. Yes, I could enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season, but I will reap that destruction here. Here I can choose to follow after God. How many want the power of God's word in your life this morning? Say amen. 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 Let me give you a third one this morning. God's word not only, number one, gives us clarity in times of confusion. Number two, gives us deliverance in times of temptation. But God's word, number three, gives us deliverance or rescue freedom from captivity. What does John 8, 32 say? Jesus says this, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You'll know the what? The truth and the truth will set you free. What is the truth? God's word is the truth. So we know the truth and the truth sets us free. But I come back to it again. You don't use the Bible like a phaser from Star Trek, just blasting at your chains. We know John 8, 32, but what does John 8, 31 say? How do we know the truth? Here, here's how we know the truth. Let me, let me show it to you again. John chapter 8, verse 31. Here's what, here's what the Bible says. Jesus is talking. He says, to the Jews who believed in him, if you hold to my teaching... You are really my disciples. Hold to my teaching. Get a hold of God's word. Don't just put it on your bumper sticker. Don't just have it as a plaque in your office or a painting in your dining room. Get a hold of his word. Pray it, study it, meditate it, memorize it, apply it, hear it. Get it into your heart. Hold to my teaching. You'll be my disciple. Then comes verse 32. You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You say, well, Glenn, how do I get a hold of God's word? Well, watch this. I want you to get your phone out in church. Everybody will always tell you, put your phone away. But grab your phone and turn your camera on. Or as my grandmother from Kentucky used to say, turn your Camry on. (laughs) All right, now they're going to put a QR code on the screen right now. So if you could go ahead and put that QR code up there. Now take your camera and focus it on that QR code. If you miss it, then come see me at my table right here. Discover Life Church, we have put together a three-page PDF. And in that PDF, here's what it has. It has six ways to get a grip on God's Word. How do you get a grip on God's Word? Number one, you hear it. Number two, you read it. Then you study it. Then you meditate on it. Then you memorize it. Then you apply it. 
Second page is how to study God's word. It's the SOAP method. And the third page is 10 verses every believer ought to memorize so they have in their lives. We need to do more than just hear the word on Sunday morning. We've got to get a handle and a grip on God's word. And then we will know the truth and the truth will what? The truth will set us free. Let me give you one final thought about God's word as I want to try to motivate you this morning to make a habit of being faithful in prayer and fasting, but faithful in God's word. The last one is this. God's word, God's word provides for us comfort in the middle of our despair. God's word provides hope in our despair. All right, now put your phone away. Look right here. I got three minutes and 30 seconds. All right, look right here. Yesterday, yesterday was the third anniversary of the last day I saw my son alive. We went out to dinner for his wife's birthday, walked across the street together to a parking garage in Virginia Beach, Virginia. We hugged and we told each other we loved each other. And I had no idea it was the last time I would see him alive. All of you know, many of you have been here, you know we lost our son tragically one day before his 25th birthday. I'm here to tell you, somebody in this room right now, you may be going through something that you are out of hope. You are at the bottom. You think there's no way that you can continue on any longer. But my message for you is this, as someone who has lived three years in incredible despair, that there is hope and hope comes from the word of God. God. God's word gives us hope in the middle of our despair. Lamentations chapter 3, verse number 21. The prophet Jeremiah, he says this, I remember my bitterness. I remember my affliction. I remember my gall. How well I remember them. Listen, someone in this room this morning, you remember it, it is flat in front of your face day after day, the horrible thing that has happened to you. But then Jeremiah said this, but this I call to mind. Sometimes you have to shut your mind off from the things that come naturally into your head and you have to say, this I call to mind. And here's what Jeremiah said, because of the Lord's great love, I am not consumed for his mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I will say of the the Lord. He is my portion. There is hope that comes from the word of God. But you've got to get that word in you so that you have it in that moment of despair. The day Grant died, I was in a Bible study at 6 a.m. on Zoom because it was still COVID. And in that study, we studied the passage that we talked about today. And I said this, yep, the question is not whether storms will come because storms are going to come into all of our lives. The question is, are we ready for them? Are we ready for them? I've got a little devotional resource for you as well. This one's not free. It's free if you can't afford it. We'll just give it to you. It's a 30-day devotional full of videos, full of a 65-page journal, stop by the table. Let me pray with you there if you're going through the worst. If you're going through something and you don't believe there's hope, let me get this in your hand. Here's what I've learned. Life's kind of like this Jenga here, you know? How many of you ever played this game? We build on the word and we stand. But when we say, you know what? I'm gonna listen to uh, everybody else's voice but God. We pull something out of there. When we say, you know what? I'm going to trust in my own strength. I'm going to trust in my own ability. I'm going to trust in what the people around me are saying instead of the word of God. When you say, you know what? I'm going to look to the world and see if there's going to be some clarity for my confusion from the world. You know that temptation? It's not so bad. I don't really need uh, any, anything from the word of God from that. And we just build bad habit after bad habit after bad habit into our lives. And at first, nothing seems to be happening. 
But after we keep building and we keep building these bad habits into our lives, guess what? Eventually, this whole thing is going to come tumbling down. That's what happens when we don't build our life on God's word. But when we build on God's word, our lives can stand in the middle of the storm. Would you bow your head, close your eyes this morning? Somebody in here, I just want to come back to that. Somebody in here, you just sense, you're just feeling like you're in the middle of despair. You're backed into a corner. You see no option to go forward. You see no way out of the situation you're in. I want to tell you this morning that there's hope, not just because of my experience, but because of God's word. If you're here this morning and you're feeling backed into a corner, you're feeling like there's no place to go, you're feeling like giving up and giving out and giving in, I just want to pray over you real quick this morning. If that's you all over the room, would you just slip up your hand right now and say, Glenn, pray for me. Lift it up, yes. Who else would lift it up? Say, I'm feeling like there's nowhere to go, yes. I'm feeling like I don't have an answer, yes. I'm feeling like, yes, thank you, the very back there. Who else? I just feel... I feel hopeless today. Father, I pray for every person whose hand is up, who's saying they're feeling hopeless. They're feeling like there's nowhere to go. There's nothing to do. There's no way that they can have an escape. Lord, I pray that you would give them clarity that comes from your word. I pray you would give them truth that would bring them deliverance. And I pray today that they would have hope that comes from the word of God. Lord Jesus, I pray for each and every person in this room that's going through something that they don't think they can go through. Lord, I just speak over them the word of God that when we walk through the fire, we will not be burned. When we walk through the flood, we will not drown. Lord, they are in the middle, but I just speak over their lives this morning. They may be in the middle, but they are going through in the name of Jesus. If you receive that this morning, shout amen. How many of you in this room today say, Pastor, I want to be a creature of habit. One of the habits I want to develop, prayer, fasting. But today I particularly want to say, I want to become a person of the word. A person who reads the word, prays the word, meditates on the word, studies the word. I am, I am ready not only to win at life, but I'm ready to prepare to win at life by being a man and a woman of the word of God. If that's you, lift your hand up all over the place. Father, I pray for every heart, for every decision that's being made to be a man and woman of the word. I pray, Lord, that they would pick up the resources we have in the back, scan that code, and even today, begin a plan of reading, memorizing, studying, getting your word in their heart so that they can stand in the midst of the storm. I pray this over them now in the name of Jesus, who is the strong son of God. And everybody says, amen, amen, amen. God bless you this morning.